Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Gabriel Dusil. I am from Adele Ecosystem Limited. We want to give you a little bit of a different presentation today. We want to give a vision of the future of blockchain and the crypto industry. Before we get there, we need to really discuss what brought us to this Adwell Media Conference. And I'd like to start a quote from Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to quote an American president. And it was from the Gettysburg Address, talking about a government that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I would like to present this statement as a basis for what Bitcoin means to us. For the first time in history, thanks to Satoshi Nakamoto, we have a currency that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, meaning that there is no government control for this currency, there is no uh, centralized control, and has created this paradigm shift in behavior and really looking at potentially this behavior as a version two of the internet moving forward. So if we have now a currency that is of the people, for the people, and by the people, then what is next? Not only just from the innovation that you're seeing at this event, but what is next really in the next five years, 10 years, and 20 years? And the start of the discussion is about understanding society. And I like to discuss this from the standpoint of, of borders. We have physical borders like land and sea. We have cultural borders like language differences and cultural differences. We have religious borders. We also have created, on purpose, for example, technological borders. We have the, so that we prevent, for example, technology being used in one part of the world compared to another. So as a society, we have a tendency to build borders let's say, protect ourselves from our enemies. But we also have another part of society that is trying to break down borders. There are humanitarian initiatives like UNICEF. We have judicial, uh, legal initiatives like the International Court of Justice. Economic borders that are being removed, for example, in the Schengen zone that we're in now. Uh, and then we have military, uh, international uh, oversight, such as NATO, we have United Nations, and important in this discussion are standards and the removal of borders so that we have international standards from which we can all follow in order for us to interoperate and communicate. So in creating borders, we're also trying to remove them as well. So let's look at borders from the standpoint of protocols. In 1973, GPS, the Global Positioning System, was created by the U.S. military. And that was a centralized system in order to identify devices anywhere around the world where they're located. Then we had Iridium for communication, telephone communication, voice and data, anywhere on the planet's surface. In the meantime, we created TCPIP initially utilized by ARPANET in the U.S. for the purposes of creating a protocol that could not be brought down by an enemy force easily. In 1999, we created peer-to-peer -peer networks, initially used in Napster, and then that was improved by BitTorrent, and now we have blockchain. I would argue that these other four protocols are very different than the first two in that they're pandemic. Pandemic in the sense that when a virus is released in the world, it's hard to get rid of that virus. We have to contain the virus. They're pervasive, they're persistent, they're hard to take down, similar to the creation of TCPIP. And we've created improvements to TCPIP, and now we're in the blockchain phase. So... Before I continue, I want to be clear on a couple things. One is what I talk about in terms of cyber versus crypto, okay? Cyber, we refer to the internet, and, and crypto is a subset in the internet space 
When I'm referring to crypto, I'm referring to specifically blockchain and virtual currencies. So what are the challenges that we face, or let's say in this case, what are the challenges of state authorities in terms of enforcing their laws in the presence of pandemic protocols? And this is a big challenge even today for any state around the world. How do they enforce their laws targeting individuals that are breaking laws, for example. So they can go after three areas. They can go after infrastructure, let's say the cyber infrastructure in their country. They can go after corporations that are registered in their country. They can go after individuals in their country, citizens, for example, or those that are resident in their, in their country. But the reality is that we have a lot of chaos right now in the legal courts on the enforcement of their state laws in cyberspace. There is a ongoing effort by every state to enforce their territorial jurisdiction, their individual jurisdiction on individuals or companies that are breaking their laws. So this is a big challenge and, and is creating a lot of chaos in the judicial system. Taking this to the next step is, is really asking these questions of how far can crypto evolve in this state of pandemic protocols? Will there be a free zone or free rule zone, let's say, or will the crypto space be self-regulated? These are uh, initiatives that are happening right now in terms of how the legal structures and the state entities are creating regulations in order to control this space because they're obviously uh, slow to keep up with the technology, as we all know. Is the virtual existence a trend for the future? So I'd like to answer these three questions through the remainder of the presentation. And to move forward, we need to understand what we mean by a state. A state is defined by a territory, is defined by a population, relationships with international states, other states, and having a functional governance, having a functional government. So how do we compare this to the crypto space? And it poses a big challenge for these states. Territory is virtual. The population is anonymous. Relations aren't really international per se because we're in a virtual space now, in a cyberspace. So we're, we're, the, the relations are now really around communities. And governance is an interesting one. This is, this is the big challenge and, and what is being considered to be solved by the blockchain is that governance is assumed to be programmatic. We have brought in to, for example, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, a programmatic code in order to prevent double spending. And that is assumed to have solved the financial issues of, of transacting between two parties. And we'll see in a moment that that actually hasn't really solved everything. Next is to look at what we refer to as the power hierarchy. And I, and I refer to this as a socioeconomic visual of the real world versus crypto. Citizens are controlled by companies because companies employ them and fire them, pay them. Companies are controlled by banks because companies need money from the banks. And banks are controlled by governments because governments set the laws that banks need to follow and everybody else. Okay, so this is, this is purely not from a human rights perspective. This is really from a socioeconomic perspective. My point is really what the hierarchy is in crypto. At the top of the chain are coders, the blockchain coders those that create the rules of any given blockchain. They set all the rules and essentially are the micro-governance of the blockchain that they are coding. Then we have the miners that are settling the transactions and creating the blocks. There are services that are below the miners, which are the exchanges and other types of services that are utilizing the blockchain. And then we have traders that are trading, utilizing these services. The interesting thing about this slide is that citizens are outside of this hierarchy. Citizens in the sense that those that don't understand technology or those that are considered technology as a barrier 
aren't entering into this market of crypto because they don't understand what trading means, they don't understand what cryptocurrency means, they don't know what Bitcoin is, and so on. So there is this exclusion, which is not necessarily on purpose, but the fact remains that it's, they are excluded from this hierarchy right now. Until we get some services into the blockchain space that bring these citizens into the hierarchy, and that requires a UI, UX, user interface and user experience in order to, to allow citizens to utilize the, the blockchain technologies and the crypto technologies. The other aspect here is that there are banks and governments are not included in the crypto hierarchy. Completely removed because that was the purpose of Bitcoin blockchain is to remove the aspect of, of government and, and banks from controlling uh, this infrastructure and this, and this technology. So you can see how this, this hierarchy of the social power, economic power, has completely flipped upside down. So let me define a couple terms. I took this from Wikipedia, and it really sets the stage from the aspect of crypto in general. There's governance. What does governance mean? If the coders are doing the governance, or is there no governance at all? Is it completely self-sustaining with no governance? Versus a sovereign state that wants to impose their power into the crypto space and they're, they're running into challenges. We also have crypto anarchists versus tech, techno-libertarianism. And the techno-libertarians want to have a minimal control of government power and the crypto anarchists want zero control of government and centrally controlled power. So these are players that all have a role and a, and a voice in this crypto space. Last one I'd like to add is Geek. And they are playing a very strong role because ultimately at the, at the power hierarchy of, of blockchain, the Geek is at the top of, the, of that pyramid. So where are we with code governance? If the blockchain or the Bitcoin blockchain is supposed to be self-governed and self-sustaining, then where are we with code governance? And the picture doesn't look that great. We have code governance to prevent double spending, but we have massive fraud. We have massive corruption. There's a lot of theft. There's unfair competition. There's a lot of monopolies now that's considered that five miners in the world control the Bitcoin blockchain. So we have millions, if, if, if not billions of dollars that, that now have been stolen in this blockchain space. So why hasn't code governance worked? And we want to explore, explore that uh, moving forward, hopefully give you some answers. And the answer starts from this slide. We refer to many systems in the world of people, process, and technology. These system essentials are essential components that run governments, that run companies, that run even your personal lives. We need to have a combination of people, process, and technology in many cases to run any given system. So we call these system essentials. The people bring the innovation, the technology brings the resilience, and the process is needed in order to really scale the solution. In blockchain, let's say smart contracts or Bitcoin blockchain, it is assumed that the process and the technology combined solves the issue of governance. So by coding the rules to prevent double spending, we have self-governance in the blockchain. But the previous slide, you saw that we have a lot of problems, right? We have a lot of corruption. So why has this happened when we are programming governance into the code? And the reason is, is because the people are still involved. People are still in this hierarchy. And we create the weak link. 
we create vulnerabilities that get exploited by hackers. Where is the cyberspace evolving to? And one of the areas we think that cyberspace is evolving to is as a borderless citizen. Their employment is in crypto, their payment salary is in crypto, their education is in crypto, and so on. So this is all part of what we, what we call cyber versification or crypto versification of this space. These individuals, they're breathing and they're eating and they're sleeping in the real world, but everything else is in the crypto space. And we're going to see more and more, we believe, this borderless citizen play out. We also see the aspect of multi-stakeholder governance playing a big role because we're not expecting to have a unilateral state-enforced legal structure into the cyberspace because there's anonymity and we can't target these individuals because we don't know who they are. The states don't know who they are. So what we believe that needs to happen is this need for a multi-stakeholder governance where there's consensus, micro-governance and macro-governance, bottom-up and top-down, where governments talk to communities and the blockchains so collectively they come to a consensus of how to govern and that will lead to standards because once we have this infrastructure of governance, we can then create standards that are based on consensus. Not legally binding standards, but a consensus-based agreement on standards in the blockchain space. And that may lead to chaining of blockchains. So we have cooperative and scalable structure so that the mainstream citizens can then participate. The last one is this aspect of what we call virtual state. You may have seen uh, Ready Player One, just came out in the theaters a couple weeks ago. It's a virtual reality concept of, of the near future. And that may play out in terms of how the existence of those in, in crypto will play not only an, uh, their acting role in this space, but their entire existence and fantasies in a virtual state. Are we ready for the future? It's clear that no individual technology is the silver bullet to solving a utopian future or a dystopian one. The reality is that blockchain probably won't be the solution to a utopian future or dystopian one, but having an expectation that blockchain or crypto will be utopian is, I believe, unrealistic. Let me finish off by saying that uh, Adele is an incubator for blockchain innovation, we incubate ideas. Our first project will be a decentralized exchange called iFin, and we're coding that right now, so look forward to, to hearing more about that as we move forward. And if you join our mailing list at adele.io, you'll hear more about that as we announce the progress of that project. This is my CV, so thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much.